We're excited to host this evening's presentation so that we can all learn more about how to appreciate the birds and flowers that we can find along the trail this spring. Uh, when I'm hiking, I always wish I knew more about what I see around me, and I'm looking forward to increasing that knowledge tonight. To begin, I want to acknowledge that the Superior Hiking Trail is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe people. At the Superior Hiking Trail Association, we work to improve the resiliency and sustainability of the trail for future generations, work we've been doing for more than 35 years. We lead by harnessing the power of volunteers, supporters, partners, and trail users to break down barriers, engage participants, and create deeper relationships between people and nature. Our association is honored to serve as the stewards of this North Shore treasure, and we're pleased to welcome you to our trail community. If you would like to support our work, please visit superiorhiking.org join to contribute. During tonight's webinar, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Annie Nelson, SHTA's Development and Communications Director, will monitor the chat and bring your questions forward during our Q&A session at the beginning, at the end, uh, during the presentation. And we'll do as, our, the best that we can to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, and we will also be uh, asking some folks to take their questions live. So just be prepared for that. If you would like that, that's great. Um, so watch for that. And Annie will give more instructions in the chat. As a photographer, author, filmmaker, and presenter, Dudley Edmondson's career has spend, spanned 32 years and offered him the opportunity to capture the beauty of nature and of our world through his lens from the Arctic Circle of Alaska to the Bahamas. Mr. Edmondson was one of the first to highlight the involvement of African-Americans in the public land system. Unsatisfied with the representation of people of color among those in outdoor pursuits, he created a set of outdoor role models for the African-American community by authoring his landmark book, Black and Brown Faces in America's Wild Places. Through presentations in galleries, national, international publications, and more, Mr. Edmondson shares his work with the larger audience, something of significant importance to him personally. Recently, the Minnesota House of Representatives appointed Mr. Edmondson to the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council, which is tasked with making funding recommendations to the legislature for the protection and restoration of Minnesota's prairie, wetlands, and forest habitats using clean water, land, and legacy funds, which means he will now be helping to restore and preserve the wildlife habitat for future generations all across the state. He's also authored What's That Flower, which is a beginner's guide to the more common wildflowers of the Eastern US. Both Mr. Edson Edmondson's books can be purchased on his website, dudleyedmondson.com. And tonight he will be sharing his experience with us helping us all to know more about birding and spring wildflower identification on the Superior Hiking Trail. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Dudley Edmondson. Hey there. <laughs> Hopefully everybody's having a good, good evening. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I have spent quite a bit of time on the trail. I live, um, actually the photo behind me is from Hawk Ridge. I live in the lakeside neighborhood, so I can access the trail uh, at Hawk Ridge and uh, I've done quite a bit of trail running there um, in the past and uh, really enjoy hiking on the trail. But this evening, you know, we were, I'm hoping that we can have some questions about birds uh, throughout the season. Um, right now we have, you know, quite a bit of stuff coming through. Uh, spring birds, uh, things like song sparrows are back, brackles. I don't know if, if even, even calling out the names of birds are, they sound familiar, but I mean, people know robins and blue jays and cardinals and all those kinds of things. And so a lot of that stuff is, is rolling back in uh, to, to the Northland. But uh, I'm hoping that people have some, some good questions about birds and wildflowers and things. Um, and, you know, for me, I was hoping that we could do just this nice giant 
Q and A. Imagine we're all in the same space, and some people have beer, some people have coffee, and we're just chatting it up in in groups and talking about stuff. And so uh, I know we're all virtual, but uh, that's kind of at least the vibe I'm I'm going for for this evening to make us all feel like we're we're in one space, and you can uh, you know pop questions in the chat, or you can. Um, I'll, allow them to unmute you and you can ask your question about birds and flowers and things like that. Um, so I'm gonna attempt a screen share. I have two monitors going here and I typically uh, will end my presentations with photo or video um, um, little setups. And I'm gonna attempt here to should we should we do photos first or, or video first? Let's uh, let's do photos first. I'm gonna just show you a, a little condensed version of, of my career as a photographer. There'll be uh, quite a collection of images. So I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. Let's see here, play in window yep so now i'm gonna hit the screen share hopefully this will work uh oh it says host has disabled screen sharing so i'm locked out let's see maybe we can we can fix that here yep it says host disabled participants screen sharing so i must not be considered a host because it's calling me a participant. So yeah, I am. Change that. Sorry, Dudley. I actually did actually have this set to allow you to screen share. So I will go back in and see what I can do. So okay. Um, well, maybe, in the meantime, maybe there's a question or two that can be yeah, asked. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Maybe maybe folks have questions about, particularly about you know spring birds, because um, it's a maybe a little early for for flowers for spring flowers yet um, but there's certainly uh, lots of birds coming back in every day um, there are just new birds today I saw a bird called a, a, a yellow shafted flicker which is definitely a migrant and it's the first one I've seen this year I was walking to the post office here in Lakeside and and saw one in a tree but uh I mean, I don't know if, if folks know, but many birds will move at night or, you know, most most land birds do move at night. And so like every morning you can have a different set of birds than the day before. Uh, sometimes your yard becomes an airport and sometimes it's a it's a sort of a, a, a landing spot. So depending on. Uh, it, a lot of times during migration, um, if you go outside and you see birds feverishly feeding in the grass and on the ground, like in the evenings, those birds are going to take flight that night. If you wake up in the morning and the ground is covered with birds, those birds have flown all night and now they're in your yard feeding. So your yard can be a departure or a, uh, you know, a flight place depending on on what time of day you see the birds i thought i saw a did i see a question pop in there we sure do we have a question okay. from um skasties uh sorry if i'm mispronouncing that is there a bird that you know is on the sht but that you haven't seen that you'd love to see this spring this spring hmm well um the bird i've i've been chasing actually for years is is still a bird called a uh an american three-toed woodpecker some people if uh may have heard that i am searching that bird <laughs> and I, I would imagine there are parts of the of the sht where that bird can be found particularly probably further up the shore um i have seen blackback woodpecker on the trail um but yeah, I don't know if there's a particular bird that uh, that I would love to see. I mean, to me, all birds are, are interesting and, and fascinating to watch. Uh, lately, I've been thinking a lot about birds that show up just a little early that 
normally feed on things like insects and and maybe fruit. I, I, I wonder what those birds are doing for food as they're they're waiting for those kinds of things to become available. Um, it'd be fascinating to, to figure out what is a, a hummingbird shows up a few days early and there's no nectar. What is he, what is he going to do? Is he going to drink a Pepsi to get some sugar or what's he, what's he going to do? But uh, yeah, I don't know if I have a particular bird. There's, there's so many species of, of sparrows and thrushes and things. Uh, I'm thinking particularly about the section of, of the trail that's in my neighborhood. I fat bike it or I trail run it. And oftentimes you're in there and you're hearing all kinds of amazing birds. And uh, what I find is that you can um, be birding both by ear and by sight. So you can actually be watching, you know, paying attention to two birds at once. Um, so it's, um, it's like you can be in an area and there's, you're looking at a bird, but then you hear another bird about 20 yards away. And so it's like, oh, there's a white throat sparrow over there, but I'm looking at a morning warbler, something like that. So, um, so do we have, do we have any other questions? Uh, we do. I wanted to start though with a request from the audience. Um, Barbara, the other mm -hmm. issue is that it's not showing just um, Dudley, it's showing all three of us and they were hoping we could put it on speaker view. All right, just a moment. And, um, and then the next question we have is if you could um, describe how to take a, a good landscape photo. Well, you know, my, my, Philosophy, philosophy about photography has come to where you go out with the greatest intentions and you try, you know, to put yourself in the best place possible to, to get a great shot. Uh, and maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. But, but I'd say the, the very first thing that I would uh, suggest is that you, you work with uh, sunrise and sunset, uh, those uh, couple of hours on either side of that, uh, uh, doing landscape photography in the middle of the day is probably not, particularly if it's a sunny cloudless day, it's probably not going to get as great a photo as you would uh, a, few hours at, a few hours after the sun rises or a few hours before the sun sets. You get long shadows, you get really warm tones, uh, even probably the photo behind me was probably taken more like um, probably in like in the afternoon, you can see the sun on Lake Superior uh, over, over my shoulder. Um, and yeah, I would say first, th those would be the first things I would say, try, try to take your photos in the morning or in the evening and not in the afternoon. Um, I would also suggest that uh, you have something sort of anchoring the the land the landscape um, frame where you have um, say something in the foreground I mean even if it you know folks can still see me uh, imagine I'm a tree <laughs> uh, so I, there's something large in the foreground and then you have the scene going out uh, behind me so I tend to a lot of times I will take photos that way using the rule of thirds where you'll have a you know, something not in the center of the screen, but something off to either side of the screen or in one of the, the corners, I'm sorry, it's not screen, but in, in the frame. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing is good to have different, you know, to have some depth in your photo. So you're having bigger things in the, in the foreground and smaller things in the background. Uh, those would be two of the um, things I could think of off the top of my head. And also, at least for me, color is really important. I like really vibrant tones and, and the more color you can get in a shot, let's say it's a, an autumn shot, um, that would you know be helpful. Um, but I'd say those, those probably be the three things I would suggest, taking photos in the morning and the evening, having 
different size things in your frame. You might have a rock or a tree in the foreground and other things in the background. And then uh, trying to make sure that, you know, you get as much colorful uh, whatever things in, in that shot. But at the end of the day, really, it, it, it's, I tell people that if you don't like the photo that you took, does it really matter what I think? So if you like your landscape shot and I don't, my opinion doesn't matter because it's your photo. So, um, you know, not being concerned about taking an image that makes other people, um, you know, happy about it or whatever, that, that's really not, not necessary. The main thing is that every day you go out and you take a photo and you come home with something you like, that's more important than anything really. You should also have screen share ability now. Okay. So, should we should we do this short video of photography and then we'll come back to some some questions so i'm going to pop that button and look at that there it is okay excellent so i'm going to say share we're on this screen and let's see we'll do a full screen hopefully we won't lose anything. Totally, we're having folks uh, not see the video or the screen share. Oops, sorry. Are, are people able to see the slide? Were people able, no one's able to see it? No, no one is able to see it at this point. Okay. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do that again. Sorry. Um, I'll go back. Hmm. Well, let's see. Let's... Let's see if it'll do it this time. And how about, can you see that? I've got a black screen. No. Black screen again. Let's see here. Well, I'm 
I'm going to share a different screen then. Share this screen. Hopefully this won't uh, screw things up too bad. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Well, then let's try that. Sorry about that. Watching a different thing now. So that was that was the, the the film that I was talking about showing. So we ended up watching that instead. It's just a a sort of a montage. At least to me, it's a montage of the the things that make nature so fascinating and wonderful to me. It's just it just I don't know. There's something about it. It's it's super beautiful and just very therapeutic. And so I like to share that film with people just to sort of show you how I see the, the natural world and that that kind of beauty. But um, yeah, sorry, sorry for the, the technical difficulty. I probably should should kill my second monitor <laughs> and uh, um, try to maybe stick with with the one here. But now that we're in here, we'll just go with it. So we'll 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 go back to some questions. I'm I'm assuming that let's I see a question of a ways back. Someone asks that they've heard several birds, they've heard birds several times on the SHT with a beautiful song that they don't hear where they live in central Minnesota. Do you know what kind of bird that could be? And I would say it depends on from that was from Karen Jansen. And uh, I would say it depends on what time of year, but the very first birds I think of that have really pretty songs, but not necessarily birds that you might see them singing are white-throated sparrow and uh, the thrushes like there's, um, we have both, actually we have three species, we have viries, we have Swainson's thrush and we have hermit thrush. And those birds tend to sing their, their songs kind of echo through the forest. It's really pretty kind of a trill. Um, and those are would be the first four species of birds I would think of that would, would do that usually because they, they sing from the forest floor for the most part or you know partially up in a tree. Um, but I guess that would be the answer. Karen, to your to your question about uh, what what that bird might be, but again, it really depends on what time of year um, that you're talking about. So, any anything else? Other questions we want to pull out, pick out? Um, yeah, there was a great one. Um, mm -hmm. 
which I would like to add on to too, but this was from Phyllis and she mm-hmm. was asking what tools do you recommend for a beginning bird watcher specific book, um, easy to carry or pack binoculars, um, best time of day or time of year to start out. And then I have one follow-up question related to that yeah. afterward. So there's, there are books and then there are apps for a smartphone. Um, and I'll start with the apps, the, the, probably the best app, if you have a smartphone, doesn't matter whether it's Android or, or Apple, but it would be the, the Merlin ID app is really good. It allows you to basically choose the, the, the colors, the most prominent colors on the bird, the physical size that you're guessing that the bird is, and whether the bird was on the ground or in a tree, that kind of thing. And you put that information in and then it will determine whether you know it'll it'll actually kick back a a few possible species and then uh, you can select from from that and then it'll ask you to confirm that that was you know was the bird that you saw so that that is a is a good identification tool that's digital Uh, field guides there's lots of people love the sibley field guides David Sibley um, is an artist and he paints uh, bird uh, portraits and uh, he, he has a field guide to the birds. Um, there's also Ken Kaufman's book is probably a lot smaller. Um, Ken Kaufman's Birds of North America uh, is a sort of a slender long book that, that might be a little easier to, to pocket. Um, and then there's uh, the Adventure Keen publication books uh, by Stan Tekela, which uh, Birds of Minnesota would be a really nice little pocket guide. I mean, in that, I used to photograph per, those, those, uh, those books. I used to photograph those for Stan, Stan Tekela and myself would photograph those books in there. They're really small. They're like four by five and they're really easy to p- slip into a, a purse or a pack or even a back pocket. Um, but they're gonna have really common birds in them, like the kind of birds, I always think of that field guide is, this guide is got the kind of birds you would see while you're standing at your kitchen sink washing dishes and looking out into your backyard. That's what kind of guide that is. It's a, a more of a backyard thing, blue jays, cardinals, chickadees, uh, those those kinds of things. So those would be my my suggestions for 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 identification tools. Uh, as far as binoculars, I would uh, probably lean towards Nikon's. Uh, they have a eight by forty two. Uh, I forgot what it's called. I think it's called a monarch. The monarch. Uh, those those are good. Um, and then Eagle Optics, which is now Vortex, I want to say, they pretty much anything Vortex, um, as far as their, their binoculars go, um, they're going to be good and budget friendly, uh, because no one wants to drop $5,000 on a pair of binoculars and then discover, you know what, I don't like birding as much as I thought I did, now what? So, so Spending, buying some Vortex or Nikon binoculars would probably be good. And I, again, I would say eight by 30 or eight by 42 would probably be your, your best sizes. So we'll, we'll do some more um, questions. Yeah, the follow-up question I had to that is, oh, yeah. um, I, whenever I go, out on the trail and I hear a beautiful bird call, you Mm -hmm. know, especially when I'm out for like a multi-day backpacking trip, by the time I get home and I start going through like the national Audubon app, trying to remember their bird call, I have no chance of, you know, I learned a bunch of good bird calls, but it's very hard to, so do you have any recommendations for how we actually hear a beautiful bird on trail? and go home and actually identify what that bird was. 
Yeah, you know, the, the first thing I would suggest is the technology uh, angle again, where you would take your phone. A lot of phones have a voice memo or some kind of recording app in them. Uh, I have a friend, a retired professor friend who oftentimes will send me recordings of birds he heard while he was out hiking and he'll say, what was this? What is that? And so just taking your phone and, and recording that, that, but also that Merlin ID app would really help a lot in that particular situation. Having the Merlin ID, uh, I think it's by Cornell and uh, Cornell University uh, Bird Lab, I believe it is. And, and it would have, um, you know, the ability to, if you could give it, you know, a little bit of information, again, uh, the dominant colors, the physical size of the bird, and then where you, whether you saw it on the ground or in a tree, um, and it might be able to help you. But, but I would say a combination of that and, and trying your best to get a recording of that bird would help a lot. And then you could send it to me and I could tell you what it was, <laughs> most likely. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I wanted to ask the audience a quick question because it was absolutely our intention to have you guys participating tonight. And I think maybe with the webinar format, we're not able to, you guys aren't able to raise your hands. So, oh. um, so I was wondering if when you're, if you're willing to ask your question in person, which we would love, um, if you could indicate that when you put your question in the chat, you know, you can just say, I'd love, you know, I'd love to ask my question live or something like that. We'll try to get some of you guys involved as well. Um, Cause we're not seeing any raised hands in the bar and I'm sure some of you would love to ask a question in person. So, oh, you can, okay. You guys do have the ability to raise your hands for some reason. Okay, okay. so I guess, never mind. I guess people were just asking in the chat. Um, okay. Next question we had for you is, um, what bird do new birders most commonly misidentify? Hmm. Good question. Um, I would say probably birds of prey uh, are, are, are commonly misidentified uh, people uh, because, and, and a lot of it's because they have ages of development, particularly like, let's say for instance, let's take for example, bald eagle has five years of development from the nest to being, uh, you know, a white-head, white-tailed bird. Um, and so a lot of times people want to call it a golden eagle because it doesn't have a white head or white tail. Um, and then uh, sometimes people might misidentify, like maybe thinking of a turkey vulture and thinking that you know, that it's something else. Um, but birds of prey, I think, are, are commonly misidentified. Um, I'm trying to think of something else. A lot of times, though, what, what happens is people might, um, th they might select, accidentally, select the most unlikely bird they might narrow it down to four or five different birds or maybe three, and then they'll select the most unlikely bird and, and believe that, that that's the bird that they've seen. And what I try to teach people is that it's better to know what birds are, are common in your area. And that way you can um, quickly eliminate all of those birds that are from Asia or, uh, you know, Russia or something like that, uh, because they're, you know, they, they can occur, but they're, they're very unlikely. Um, so it's like just knowing, knowing the common birds in wherever you live, uh, the birds that are common here along the shore of Lake Superior might not be as common let's say inland in the, you know, the, the central lakes area or something like that. And so um, just getting, getting familiar with the kinds of birds that normally are found in your area probably can help you eliminate doing those kinds of things. Uh, 
Okay, next, the next question we have from the audience is, um, do you, are you worried about avian influenza at all uh, in birds on the trail? No, I mean, I, when there was, oh, I can't remember. It's been, been a number of years, but I had seen some, some dead uh, crows that I was pretty sure had gotten bird flu or whatever it was that was going around that was particularly affecting crows. But I, I am not um, concerned about that um, and, unless someone knows otherwise or, or the state, you know, maybe puts out some kind of an alert or something like that. But no, I, I am not. And Barbara, we do have our first question from the audience. Can we um, bring um, Carol Ann into the conversation? Carol Ann, you can take it away. Hi, Dudley, this is Carol Burns. And I wondered if you could tell us what plants you have in your yard that attract the most birds or the most interesting birds. Hey Carol, nice to hear hear your voice. Uh, yeah, you know uh, it, it's interesting because there are a lot of double duty flower, you know, that that both serve birds and and pollinators, and you know things like uh, purple cone flower and uh, you know anything that's going to produce a lot of what they call it composite family flowers, sunflowers, black eyed Susan. Again, purple coneflower, daisies, those kinds of things, um, you know, can can certainly be good for butterflies, but also for birds. Uh, anything that produces, um, I'm trying to think of the plant that. Uh, let's see, because you you get American goldfinch that that uses the thistle of like tall woodland sunflower uh, to line its nest. Uh, but you know that that flower before it goes to seed serves serves uh, pollinators, butterflies. We you know the monarchs that everybody's familiar with. Uh, but yeah, I mean just about anything: cabbage butterflies, uh, painted ladies, um, all the crescents and things that we have. Smaller butterflies that that come through. But um, yeah, having having a uh, a nice native plant garden can really be beneficial to both uh, birds and butterflies. Of course, milkweed's a, another good one. So uh, any of those are, are really good. Thanks for the question. Ask another one, I'll ask it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear Tom in the background. <laughs> hey, hey, can I ask one of your children's name? <laughs> Go for it, Tom. Okay, I'm still here. Okay, uh, Dudley. Yes, sir. I know from some of your emails uh, that you and I exchanged that there are rules about feeding bald eagles and, and maybe other raptors. I've never heard of such rules. Not that I do that particular act. Is, is that mm -hmm. something you can talk about? You, you can't do something to attract bald eagles? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, bald eagles are, uh, for the most part, most of our birds, whether they're raptors or, or passerines, are, are protected by federal, federal law. But bald eagle in particular is definitely a huge no-no. Um, you know, you can't, can't bait them, put things out for them. Um, you know, just, well, it's the national bird, um, but yeah, there are, um, there are, are prison sentences related to, uh, <laughs> engaging the, 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 our, our national bird, um, you know, with even, you know, harassing them at the nest or feeding them or any of those kinds of things. And, but generally speaking, I mean, you know, all birds are, are protected should be if if they're not but pretty much all uh passerines and raptors are protected by you know federal federal law and you you really don't want to be uh putting anything out for them but you know you certainly with with 
songbirds, obviously there's there's no law against filling up, uh, you know, sunflower seed feeders and thistle feeders. I've got common red poles still coming to my yard, but in the last few days, there have been an increase in, in dark-eyed juncos and song sparrows that are starting to roll through. Again, these birds are moving at night uh, and they magically appear the next morning in your yard uh, and may not have been there the day before, but yeah, uh, do, not, do not intentionally feed bald eagles. <laughs> you might go to jail or prison. And Karen would like to know what your favorite bird is and why. <laughs> you know, it's hard to pick a favorite bird. I mean, I uh, probably one of my favorite birds is a bird you don't find around here. And, and I love it for its song. It's a bird called a varied thrush. Uh, so we have Swainson's thrush, hermit thrush, and veery. Uh, but also in that same group of thrushes, of course, there's the American robin and bluebirds. They're all, all of those species are, are thrushes. Uh, but the very thrush is a bird you find out west, Washington State, Oregon, probably California. And it just has this beautiful song. There's something about thrushes. They, again, they, they sing in the forest and you don't see them. You just hear this beautiful echoing sound coming through the forest and for me very thrush it's hard to describe but it sounds like a distant soccer game in terms of you hear the the whistle that blows like from a coach or a referee or something like that and so it sounds like I don't know why it sounds like a a, a game a soccer game that's being played about a quarter of a mile away or something like that. But my other favorite thrush is probably wood thrush for the exact same reason. The, the, the wood thrush, if you get a chance to Google wood thrush and listen to that bird's song, it might be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. Uh, wood thrush are amazing. Again, you're not going to find them here in northern Minnesota. You might find them in, in certainly in southern Minnesota, but they're um, the places they're more common would be the, you know, the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, you're going to, you're going to find them. They're more of a, of a deciduous forest bird, you know, so as opposed to coniferous with, you know, I mean, here we have mixed forests, but, um, you know, you, you're more likely to find them in a maple oak forest than you would in a, in a, a white birch, um, you know, uh, pine forest like what we have around here, but l listen to to wood thrush. It is absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> and it's the did you say it's the Swainson's thrush that we have up here along the SHT? Yeah, we have Swainson's, Veery, and Hermit thrush. But I would say probably the Swainson's is the most common. You and and again, these are birds that they walk on the ground. Um, kind of like a robin. Well, you know, they're all related. Uh, robin is, the Latin name is Turbis migratoris, but I'm, I don't know for sure if those three species are in the Turtis genus. I'd have to look, uh, but they, but they are all considered um, thrushes. So, um, but yeah, Swainson's thrush would probably be the most common thrush that you would see here. And it has a beautiful song, but it can't hold a candle to a wood thrush. Okay. Well, now you have me intrigued because that's the Swainson's is for sure my favorite. And it was the yeah. first time uh, the SHC group crowdsourced a bird identification for me because I described the call as a backward xylophone and somebody knew oh, exactly okay. what I was talking about. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then let's see, Robbie was hoping you could help his group know they're going to be up by Grand Marais between May 13th uh, through the 17th. And they're wondering what kinds of birds and plants they might expect to see that time of year up there. Well, it, I mean, it depends on how our spring progresses, but, uh, you know, I would think that the forest floor should have some, some pretty decent stuff. There might be some violets popping. 
Um, I'm not sure with, you know, how much soil, uh, because a lot of the spring ephemerals, they, they tend to, at least the ones I'm familiar with, tend to, you know, have rich, very rich soils uh, associated with them or, is, you know, where you would find them. Um, i trying to think of what really is popping around that time of year plant-wise. I know bird-wise, you're going to, you're probably going to have a, a quite a few warblers, certainly some, uh, maybe the ducks might have come through already, but you'll have gulls, ringbill and herring gulls, um, and maybe uh, some other uh, sort of what they call sea ducks, which would be the mergansers, like red-breasted mergansers, stuff like that, um, might be be out on the, um, you know, out on, on the big lake. Um, certainly the raptors, turkey vultures, uh, the nesting peregrine falcons, there's several, several uh, pairs of peregrine falcons that, that use the North Shore cliffs. So those birds will certainly be back and calling and you, you may not see them unless you get close to their nest. And then you, you might wish you had not seen them. <laughs> Uh, because peregrines are notorious for uh, being quite violent and vicious. Uh, people have been literally knocked unconscious by peregrine falcons hitting them in the head. And uh, so people I know who work with them at the nest usually wear hard hats uh, because it's not uncommon for the birds will ball their fists up and they will just fly at you two-fisted <laughs> and pop you in the head and knock you out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, but, but it's the same thing they would, uh, you know, sometimes they, they may use that tactic to, to, to you know, for, for prey as well, potentially to, to knock something out and, and then grab it. Uh, but yeah, they, I, I had a peregrine here in Duluth fly at me and I couldn't, believe if I hadn't moved, she would have knocked me out. There's no doubt. She would have hit me right in the forehead. Um, <laughs> I was at her, at the nest photographing the, the, the young being banded by the uh, U, U, University of Minnesota. Um, but yeah, those, those birds are rough. So yeah, I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, that time of year, there's just a lot of migration going on, particularly with birds. And it really depends on the weather, how far north birds can get. Yeah, today I was out on my walk um, and I noticed large flocks of American robins actually flying back south and east, uh, you know, right around the time it was snowing here in Lakeside. And I, you know, I can't say for sure that they were sort of doing a, a retreat, uh, maybe a temporary one, um, but there were, I must have counted at least three or 400 robins that were flying back south and east over towards Wisconsin. Um, and so, you know, when the weather is not great, birds, I've heard other people report seeing birds flying back down the shore. So it really depends on, on how the weather holds up uh, for, for, um, for the, that, that time, so. Uh, and and same would be true with with the plants too. So, and then um, Lisa was wondering if the birders hotline is still active. Yeah, you know the actual um, the actual recording is not. Uh, what ends up happening is that people report their sightings to eBird and then eBird, if you check off that you wanna get that report every day, really, uh, you will get the report from eBird that tells you the rare birds that have been found in the state or in your city. And so every day I, and, and then actually also in the country. And so I get, those three emails every day, they pop up at St. Louis County, the state of Minnesota, and then the American Birding Association puts out a, a rare bird alert uh, thing as well. So um, that that all kind of happens. But yeah, the recording that, that they have for many, many years, that is, is no longer 
available. I think it's because of the digital technology is sort of taken over and people just uh, are, you know, they're using the apps um, and, and using eBird to get, get that information. I think um, you had mentioned that you had some, maybe some photos that you were going to share to. Um, yeah. Do we yeah, want to try that? We can do a little learning. Let's see. Yeah, I'm going to, first I'm going to find it. And then we can give, okay, so I have it here. So we'll do the screen share. And we'll do the screen that we are on here. And share. And here we go. And I think, um, would you mind just speaking a little bit about the species we're seeing as we're watching? Yeah, you know, the, um, this is from my garden, uh, just some flowers. Uh, I'll point out birds as we, we get to them. If we, I can't remember how many, if any birds are in here. <laughs> That's delphinium and oh, I can't remember the other flower. Or my apologies, um, just sharing whatever you wish about yeah, your yeah, photography. Yeah, that's ring neck duck for this one. Great gray owl. Some sandhill cranes there at the end. And that's that's it. Ta <laughs> Thank you. Um yeah. And we do have more questions if you, if you're yeah, great. Okay. Um <clears throat> So I think the person who asked about the bird hotline had a follow-up question as well. Um, mm. If there are any informal birder outings happening in the Duluth area currently, or I suppose for the group anywhere along the SHT. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And um, I know Laura Erickson had, had led some bird, uh, like Saturday morning bird hikes, but it's been a number of years. And so I don't know of any that are going on now. I've actually been thinking of doing one in my neighborhood, like uh, Saturday morning birds and coffee and just with the, the locals and we meet on the corner and just walk a couple of blocks and, and watch birds. But I don't, I don't know of any that are, that are happening. Um, so I, I would, I don't know. I, I would say check with Duluth Audubon, check their website would be my suggestion um, and see, see what they have going on. Uh, 
And then uh, switching over to some wildflower, um, yeah. Phyllis was hope, or I'm sorry, uh, Lisa was hoping to know what your favorite spring ephemeral um, that can be located along the SHT in the Duluth area is. Yeah, you know, I, at least I, I, I think of them as such, and it probably be the, the trout lily probably uh, should be something you'd be able to find. And, uh, you know, maybe even some, I don't know, I guess I don't, I don't think uh, large lot trillium is, is one, but I'm just thinking like the best place I can think of would be to probably be like in Jay Cook State Park is probably some of the best areas I can think of to find spring ephemerals um, around, around here. Um, I'm trying to think of other places because I'm just thinking about the soil, maybe Magni Snively. I'm sure there's probably a lot of really great stuff in Magni Snively Park. Yeah, that would, that's probably actually closer and better. Um, the uh, skyline, um, what is it, West Skyline, that, that area off of Midway Road where you drive, drive uh, Skyline Parkway there, I would say would be a really good place to find, find uh, spring ephemerals in, in the Duluth area. Um, and I think we're probably just going to take a couple more questions, if that's okay with you. Sure. And um, I think uh, someone is eager as am I to hear about, um, they, they said they have your first book, but they would also love to hear a little bit about your wildflower book. Yeah, the, the Wildflower book was done by DNK Books out of, out of London, and it was just, um, you know, a, a really beginner's uh, guide to, to wildflowers, some of the more common flowers, um, and it, uh, it was, I can't remember, I think it was 2013 that, that I put that book together for them and, and did, all, did all the photography, um, and it was just, I don't know, I felt like it was something that I could do. Actually, what had happened, strangely enough, is they had um, asked me for photos to illustrate the, the, the field guide. And then uh, they realized they, they had not hired a writer for the book. So they were requesting photos before they actually had somebody to write the book, which I thought was rather strange. Uh, so... They asked me if I would do it, man, and I did it. So that book um, has got, you know, quite a few things in there, probably more, more of, of the flowers you would find probably, you know, east of the Mississippi and in the Midwest and, and uh, those, those kinds of areas and, and then even heading to the East Coast and things. So, uh, but that was a, a fun book to, to do. I'm, I'm working on a new book, uh, a, basically trying to spotlight uh, scientists of color and uh, environmental justice leaders of color around the country and sort of bringing them all together in, in one book and having them um, sort of talk about some of the projects and things they're working on, as well as some of the issues they're finding in their communities with, you know, lead pipe uh, issues with, with drinking water and uh, factory pollution that uh, like metal recycling plants that are polluting, you know, communities and uh, people who are planting, you know, gardens in their yards are uh, finding themselves, uh, actually some, some people are getting ill from eating their own garden vegetables because of the lead that is in that uh, residue that's coming out of those factories and people are getting cancer. So those are some of the uh, subjects that I'll be covering in, in my next book that hopefully will, if I can get everything to the publisher this November, it will be out uh, next year, so. We have one more question. Um, yes, I think we do. And I, I was hoping we could end it with something 
kind of weird and fun, which is um, sure. a, a discussion about the parasitic plants we see along oh. the SHT. Yeah. Um, so the, my favorite one, I think, is called uh, the corpse plant, which looks like the skeleton fingers growing out of the ground. Can you talk a little bit about what those plants are and how they're different from the other things that we see out there? Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm not that familiar with those, really. Uh, but I would, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking you're referring to the plants that maybe they get their nutrients from, um, you know, from like, say, eating insects or, uh, you know, plants that grow in poor soils tend to, to do that, like Venus flytrap or pitcher plant and those kinds of things that, that there aren't a lot of nutrients in the soil, so they, they pull their uh, sustenance out of the sky in the form of flies and ants and things like that. But yeah, I guess I, I'm not, I have to be honest, I'm not familiar with that plant. I'm, so um, the corpse plant, I will, I will check that out. I see lots of, uh, lots of things in the chat, but uh, yeah. Just um, a thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, we did have one more specific birding question about, uh, Barbara, do we have time for that? Or would you like to, yep. About how, if you go birding with middle and high school students um, mm -hmm. and how you get them excited about being outside and finding birds. Yeah, you know, I'm hoping to get out with uh, the kids from um, Harbor City School this year. I, I did a talk uh, at their school last year and, and uh, indicated that I'd be happy to come back and, uh, uh, you know, go, go for a hike with them. And, and I think what I like to do is not necessarily take them out of their community, but find as much uh, interesting, you know, birds and things right where they are, like right on the school grounds. And, and, uh, you know, a lot of schools have forests like, uh, here in, in East Duluth, East school has a forest that actually has a bald eagle nest, uh, you know, in, in their forest. And, uh, you know, I would say getting, getting kids interested in the birds that are right in, you know, where they're, they're attending school. Cause, you know, maybe they can even, on a lunch break or recess or whatever, they can, you know, check out birds that are, that are right there on the grounds. But, uh, you know, just getting them to know that everything's not a sparrow, everything's not a gull or a pigeon, and that there are over 800 different species of birds that can be found in North America. So I think that that, uh, hopefully that, that might uh, encourage them to be a little more curious. Well, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> it's just been wonderful to listen to you share all that you know um, and for inspiring us all to learn more about the forest that we love. Um, we, we're so grateful you've shared your passion with us and your knowledge of the outdoors. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, if, if people get a chance, seriously, go, go Google Wood Thrush and listen to that song. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We'd like to give a special thanks to those who donated at registration. Um, if you haven't donated and would like to do so, you can make a donation or become a member at superiorhiking.org slash join. Uh, support from trail users like you powers our work of keeping the SHT beautiful for hikers and allows us to provide helpful trail information like this. Um, if you'd like to join us for more online events, follow us on social media, or sign up for our monthly e-newsletter, Trail Mix. We hope you enjoy your spring outings on the trail um, even more after tonight's uh, presentation. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Good night. Good night.